What I'm going to talk to you about today comes from my heart, from my experience in life, from playing this role as messenger, which I take very seriously, from my efforts to wake up the American people, from my family, from all the letters that I get, from people that I talk to, just like I've talked to many of you here today. I've learned some things. And I think these things need to be passed on to you. And I think you need to start examining yourself, your agenda, your mission. Who are you? What are you about? What do you believe about America? Is it true? Are you helping to divide us more? Or are you helping to bring us together? Do you really understand what this country is all about? If you listened to shortwave radio throughout the 1990s, you were bound to invariably come across the sound of a captivating voice in the wilderness. That authoritative and self-assured voice for five nights a week would educate us, enlighten us, and most importantly, warn us of things to come. So they disguised their true intent and their true teachings, the esoteric, with a system of exoteric descriptions that to the profane would mean one thing and to the initiate or the adept would mean quite another but that was then this is now what sort of creature inhabits the modern domain who is the modern man that voice spoke to us of matters esoteric and exoteric political and supernatural scientific and lawful. That voice was world-renowned author, radio show host, and ex-naval intelligence officer Milton William Cooper, otherwise known as Bill Cooper. In that, I was reared in a military family. My father's an Air Force colonel. He's retired now. He was a command pilot. From, and I traveled all over the world, lived on military bases for most of my life. I was really... Uh, uh, an indoctrinated individual, you might say. I was, I was uh, as establishment as you could get, as gung ho, pro government, pro uh, America, pro military, and that's why I went into the military, um, because that had been so much of my life. I went into the Air Force. I was in the Strategic Air Command for four years uh, as an aircraft and missile hydraulic technician. Bill left the Air Force in 1965 to join the United States Navy. Cooper was a member of the Office of Naval Security and Intelligence, serving as a harbor and river patrol boat captain at Da Nang and the Dong Ha River Security Group, Qua Viet, Republic of Vietnam. William Cooper was awarded several medals for his leadership and heroism during combat, including two with V for valor. He served on the intelligence briefing team for the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, it was during this time Bill would witness something that would forever change his life. While we were on a transit from the Portland, Seattle area on the surface, I actually saw, I was the port lookout, uh, and I saw the most incredible thing that I think I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and, it, and it had such a profound effect upon my view of the universe and the world that we live in uh, that I wish everybody could experience this. I saw come up out of the ocean, from beneath the surface of the sea, a huge disc-shaped craft about the size of a Midway-class aircraft carrier, which is tremendous in size. Came up out of the ocean and rose into the air and tumbled on its axis and went up into the clouds. And I was awestruck, dumbstruck. And uh, I mean dumbstruck, literally, I could not utter a sound. Uh, and my first um, impulse was to tell the officer of the deck that I'd seen a flying saucer. and then. Luckily for me, I couldn't talk. So I told the officer of the deck that I'd seen something about 15 degrees off the port bow at a relative distance of about two and a half nautical miles. And uh, um, he began to look in that area. And the starboard lookout had heard me tell him this, and he began to look over there. Um, and it did something that, that as far as I knew, 
was absolutely impossible. I'd been in the Air Force. I'd worked on the state of the art of our of our uh, aviation capabilities, and here I was on the deck of a submarine in the conning tower, and I knew what we had to be able to have to go underwater, and I knew that the two were incompatible. Here's something that came from under the water and flew in the air and performed maneuvers and then came back down and interfaced with the water at tremendous speed uh, and remained intact, uh, which realistically it, it, it never touched the water. The water sort of magically opened up in front of it, but something had to interface with that water. Anything that we had that interfaced with the water in that manner would have been disintegrated. It's like hitting a brick wall. So I was looking at a technology that as far as our laws of physics and what we knew at that time didn't exist. This was in 1966. But when we reached Pearl Harbor, we were not allowed to go ashore to, um, to uh, go on liberty, even though we didn't have the duty. And about two hours after we berthed uh, at the submarine base, a commander from the Office of Naval Intelligence came on board and uh, debriefed each one of us individually in the captain's stateroom. And the, uh, the ultimate outcome of the debriefing was that uh, we didn't see anything, we didn't hear anything, and we had to read rules and regulations uh, that told us that if we ever talked about what it was that we didn't see, um, that we could uh, be imprisoned, uh, we could be fined uh, $10,000, we could lose all pay and allowances due or ever to become due. And I learned at that moment that the United States Navy didn't want anybody to know um, about what we saw and that uh, severe consequences could come down around the neck of anybody who did. This one event had started Bill on what would become a lifelong quest that would lead him into investigative territories such as extraterrestrial life, high-level government cover-ups, and the role secret societies play in all these scenarios. Bill had begun to publicly discuss his findings only to lose his leg after being forced off the road by people who would later visit him in the hospital telling him to keep quiet. Bill went public once again but made sure this time he was protected. Uh, orig originally back I guess when Bill was first starting to release all of this material uh, he had released a document called The Secret Government, uh, subtitled The Origin, Identity, and Purpose of MJ-12. And Bill had spent a considerable amount of his fortune at that time, well, not that there was any fortune, but a um, considerable amount of his money, to into the tens of thousands of dollars, to get this document released and disseminated across North America and the world. So he had mailed it to all sorts of congressmen, uh, key political figures, as well as some uh, friends and family and things like that, just so people would have this document in their hands. Uh, and that's how I protected myself, or, or at least that's what I thought would protect me, and so far it's proven to be right, was that if I got literally in front of the public overnight, in front of a large public, um, that they wouldn't do anything to me because it would substantiate what it was that I'm saying. And they certainly don't want to do that. It would also create a martyr. And martyrs create tremendously dangerous political movements that they don't want that either. Mm -hmm. um, so literally, within a 24-hour period, I spent $27,000 mailing a thick packet of information all over the world to people I'd never heard of, didn't know. We went down and got some mailing lists and just mailed the stuff all over the world. And I've been in front of the public ever since. So I think basically those are the reasons. They don't believe that the public's really going to listen to me. Okay. And so far, that's, that's been true. There is a small group of people all over the world who are awakening, mm -hmm. who are beginning to understand that they've been living their life in fantasy land, and who are actively seeking the truth. But by and large, when, when the secret power structure says, as I've put in the first chapter of my book, right out of one of their own technical manuals, that a nation or world of people who do not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence and thus are stakes on the table by choice and consent. They're absolutely right about the majority of people. Bill, Bill was frightened for his life back in those days. And he needed some way to get the information out to a large number of people. And keep in mind, this was 
in the days long before the internet. So there was no real uh, practical, very easy way for people to do this kind of dis disseminating their information or, or documents that they had. It was very difficult back in those days and the only way would have been through probably the printed word would have been the easiest way. So that's what Bill had done. He had made many, many copies of this secret government. The secret government was an amalgamation of Bill's continued research into UFO phenomena and was first introduced at the MUFON Symposium on July 2nd, 1989 in Las Vegas, Nevada. The document highlighted his research into the UFO crash in the late 40s in Roswell, New Mexico and documents that alluded to President Truman's knowledge of extraterrestrial life and his administration's efforts to keep it quiet. Cooper had seen these documents while serving in naval intelligence. But eventually, when they began to have confidence in me, uh, I began to see things coming across my desk that were just absolutely incredible. And, and a lot of it is, is really hard to talk about because it's so far uh, outside the normal concept of reality for the average American that, uh, that they're going to find a hard time uh, believing any of it. Mm -hmm. But I saw documents that were uh, labeled uh, under the classification top secret and uh, the compartmentalized, uh, or the compartment that that was put into it was called MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C, mm -hmm. um, which told me that, uh, that UFOs are real, which I already knew. I'd seen one. Right. Uh, but this went farther than that. It told me that they were extraterrestrial in origin, that there were four different extraterrestrial uh, species or races visiting this earth, uh, and that they had actually entered into an agreement with the United States government with one of these uh, species um, of alien beings to exchange technology, and it told me all the projects that, that uh, was underneath this. Uh, uh, Project Red Light was actually the testing of extraterrestrial craft. Um, uh, project Plato was a diplomatic project. Uh, Pounce was the recovery of technology. Uh, Pluto was the, uh, the application of that technology to our own secret space program, not the public space program. There are two different space programs. One is the, what the public gets to see, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, overseen by NASA. And the other one is a secret space program that nobody gets to see, which is really overseen by um, uh, the Navy Department uh, under, under specialized, uh, uh, compartmentalized black projects. I also saw uh, documents under an operation called Operation Majority, which uh, outlined the plans to bring together a one world government and also included extraterrestrial information within that. Um, uh, Project Grudge which was uh, the second project, first was signed, and then Project Grudge, which contained all of the extraterrestrial information up to a certain point, I forget the year cutoff, and then it was contained after that in another project uh, called Project Aquarius, which was the accumulation of the whole history of alien inter interaction on, on planet Earth. Um, but I have to say at this point that I don't know if those documents were really telling the truth or not. They could have been showing me these things so that eventually I would go out and talk about this. And uh, maybe that will become clear to you later why they may have done that. Um, it could be real. So. Bill, at this time, was acquiring a reputation as a UFO specialist. Unlike others in the movement at that time, Bill's credibility was unique because of his experience in naval intelligence. In the late 1990s, however, Bill reconsidered much of what he was saying, as his research led him to believe the technology he and others were witnessing may have been the creation of our own government, created and tested in areas such as the infamous Groom Lake, Area 51 in Nevada, where Bill filmed his documentary, Project Red Light. Bill was actually the first one to go to Area 51 and start filming some of these UFOs or alien spacecraft, whatever they may have been. Bill always maintained that it was a military base, which it is. We all know that now. In the early days, the uh, U.S. military refused to even acknowledge it existed until Bill Cooper got an aerial, a satellite photograph from the Russians, which proved it existed. We could see the uh, landing strips, 
all this kind of stuff and clearly there were there was some sort of infrastructure there there were buildings and something was happening so Bill decided in, for a number of years was taking expeditions up to Area 51 and he would take people there and maybe one night they wouldn't see anything at all but most nights uh, there was some UFO activity. Doyle Shamley, a Gulf War veteran and Army reservist, had paralleled Bill's quest for answers. The two met at a research conference Doyle had been arranging and soon the two became tight research allies. Doyle would eventually leave the reserve and join Bill in Arizona to conduct full-time research up until Bill's death. Then he, he realized his research at the time was heavily with uh, Lars Hansen and many of them in the UFO realm. And he realized that most of them, and a lot of them upon admittal, and I have the documents, admitted to being working for either in the past or still being on CIA payroll. And he exposed them heavily. <laughs> speaking gave engagements and accused them of falsifying uh, facts, as they called them, to steer people away from an eventual finding out of all the facts and send them down all these wild goose chases. In all the history of the world, folks, if we were really being visited by extraterrestrial life, don't you think we would have found one by now? Don't you think so? And how come the government always gets there first? It's podunk time. It's in the middle of nowhere. There's a farmer milking his cow, flying saucer crashes, and the government gets there before he can get from his cow to the crash site. <coughs> it's ridiculous. And I shudder to think that in the beginning, when I first came public, I may have been misleading somebody along those lines that, that this whole thing is being brought about by extraterrestrials. I think some of us were really used in the service of our country, and I'm very angry about that. He then realized that the scope of it was not going to be handled by just searching the paranormal. We had to get more into our worldly realm right here, right now, the politics, the economics, and that's when he shifted more towards government type studies. In the history of the world there had never been a people who were truly free or who truly ruled themselves until the United States of America was created as a republic by which we ruled ourselves through elected representatives whom we sent to the state house either in the states or, or to Congress um, to do it. They also gave us every tool by which we would destroy ourselves if we weren't capable of doing it. The United States and France, the revolution in this country and the revolution in France were created to bring about governments which would function as the antithesis to the kings and queens of the world and cause them to topple off their thrones. It also gave man a chance to prove once and for all whether he could rule himself or not. And if he could, fine, that would be the new world order. If he couldn't, they built the tools into the Constitution to allow them to take it away from us. And those tools are the creation of the federal democracy within the boundaries of Washington, D.C., and the right to contract, through which, if we were irresponsible, we would contract to receive rights from that federal democracy and thus, in return, give up our freedom. And that's exactly what's happening. After lecturing, releasing documents, and doing talk radio for a number of years, Bill had finally synthesized his research, life experiences, and philosophical insights into what would become one of the most popular underground conspiracy books of all time. Behold a pale horse. horse. Beyond a doubt, I think the work that introduced Bill Cooper to the world has to be Behold a Pale Horse. Now, Bill had released a, a lot of other documents and things, but uh, up until 1991, when the book was published, self-funded, by the way, the book starts out with Bill describing himself, uh, who Bill Cooper is. He was re reared in an Air Force family, goes uh, through his early childhood years up to when he came back from Vietnam, and then where he got all of this information that he was putting into his book and why he felt 
compelled that he had to release this information. This title is, is from the book of Revelations because I, I have to tell you this, and, and you may think I'm nuts if you want to, uh, but this is the truth. Either these men are following the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is, is it is in the, in the Bible, mm -hmm. they're either following it just like a plan and bringing the prophecies in there to pass to manipulate and control those who believe in those prophecies and neutralize them, so to speak. In other words, uh, if this is written in the Bible and God has ordained it, who am I to resist? It must come to pass, so I'm not going to I'm not going to try to stop it. Okay. What a perfect way to neutralize the opposition right off the bat. Or there really is a God. And what he said was going to come to pass is coming to pass. And I named this, Behold a Pale Horse, from uh, chapter 13 of the book of Revelations. The fourth horse, the fourth horseman of the apocalypse is the pale horse. And I looked, and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with the beasts of the earth. And that is taking place now today. The fourth horseman is riding across the world now. That's what AIDS is all about. That's what all these little brush fire wars all over the world are all about. That's what's happening. That's why cancer cures are suppressed. So it's not hidden at all. It's there for anybody who wants to look. And I get people who still come to me all the time and say, Bill, you're all wrong. It's the Jews. The Jews are subverting the world. Man, it's not the Jews. It's not the Catholics. It's not the blacks. It's these men who belong to the ancient mystery schools who meet in secret and decide the fate of the world. And they belong to all different races and all different nationalities and all different religions to the public point of view. But in secret, it's a different story. Bill's second major contribution, and arguably his most compelling, was the 42 hours worth of dedicated broadcasts into the history, origins, and agendas of secret societies. The series was simply called Mystery Babylon, and began with an interpretation of the Stanley Kubrick classic 2001, A Space Odyssey. To simplify, I guess we could say that Bill took us on a journey through the language, religion, uh, and symbology of of the elite, the power structure. What do these people believe? He started out with something modern and then took us way back into the ancient texts uh, of the, the mystery schools, ancient Egypt, some of the, uh, the beliefs and mythology of ancient Egypt, tons and tons of Masonic works and uh, other mystery texts. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we begin the origin, the history, the dogma, and the identity of the ancient mystery religions which are now known as the Mystery Schools, the Order of the Quest, Freemasonry, the Ancient Order of the Rose and Cross, the Knights Templar, the Sovereign and Military Order of the Knights of Malta, the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, the Priory de Sion, the Thule Society, or sometimes known as the Thule Society, the Order, the Skull and Bones, the Russell Trust, the Jason Society, the Scroll and Key, the Illuminati, and I could go on and on and on and on. But the most important thing to realize is that they all have been collectively known throughout the ages as the mystery schools, the Illuminati, which literally means illumined ones. They are all one and the same, as you will come to know. And you will understand perfectly how they've been able to infiltrate all of our society. What you hear tonight does not necessarily reflect my views or beliefs our religion.
have ruled from the shadows, you see. And they call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages. And their first, their first religion was called astrotheology, or the worship of the heavens. And their first object of worship was the sun. The second object of worship was the moon. And everywhere you see the mystery schools or the mystery religion, you will see the symbols of the sun and the moon, also known as Osiris and Isis. For in the religion of the mystery schools, they believe that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust and vindictive God. And that man was not told by this unjust and vindictive God that he could have the same powers. And man was set free from the bonds of ignorance by Lucifer through his agent Satan, and many believe that the two are the same. That's okay, because maybe they are. And that through the gift of intellect, man himself will become God. Now, for those of you who understand what I am imparting to you now, you may not even have to listen any farther, for it explains everything that has ever happened in the history of man, and everything that is happening now, and all that is to happen in the future. They believe that the tree-dwelling ancestors of man were among the most intelligent beings of their distant age. And when these creatures finally abandoned the trees and walked fully upright, freeing their hands to serve as implements of their minds as well as their bodies, there began the most successful evolutionary drive toward higher intelligence ever witnessed in nature. Now notice, Lucifer was called the son of the morning star. He was also called the morning star. And there is a great mystery here. Because Christ also called himself the morning star. But I have been told by those who have been initiated in the mystery schools that Christ and Lucifer are one and the same being. What you believe, of course, is your own business and is not my intention to make you believe anything but rather to impart to you what I have learned over many many years of study in to the secrets of those who worship the ancient mystery religions in secret for thousands of years I do not advise you what you should believe or not believe. But I do advise you that we all need to learn as much as we can about everything that we can. Because one thing I have learned in my life is that most of what we have ever been taught has been a lie. And that whoever these people are, who are the priests, the adepts, and the initiates, and the mystery schools. They are in control, and they are shaping the future, and that future will affect all of us, so we had better learn as much about them as we can. One of the, the brilliant things about Bill was that he was able to fluidly switch between when he was reading to when he was commenting, so that sometimes it was imperceivable. He had such a a uh, fantastic grasp of uh, the English language that he could speak to you almost the same way that these ancient texts did. We have to be very careful about how we interpret what we read, especially the Bible. And I'll tell you why. When I research these secret societies and I research the Bible, and by the way, I'm a Christian, so if you're a Christian, don't think I'm knocking your religion. I'm not. I'm just telling you what I found. 
I have found that at the very heart and core of all these secret societies lurks the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is the ancient Jewish mysticism. It is a method of encoding information through a system of mathematics and numbers. It is some of the most ancient knowledge that man has ever possessed and has been kept secret and given only to those who have proven themselves worthy through the process of initiation. Nobody knows where it comes from. I can tell you this, it was there long before the Jews came along. The Jews just took it and preserved it and they passed it down and it's used by everybody because it's at the heart and core of the secret knowledge, the metaphysics, the real science that none of us know anything about. These people that belong to the secret societies never dared to write down in any language what they knew, what it was that they were guarding, because then someone could steal it and then the secret would be out. So they devised secret systems of encoding the secrets of the ages, the knowledge, the hidden knowledge, the occult. Now occult doesn't mean evil. It doesn't mean the devil. It doesn't mean Satan. Occult means hidden. It means hidden. That's all it means. So they took this knowledge and they made it occult through a system of encoding encryption one of which is mathematics, numbers. Another is architecture. Everybody wonder why do they have a fraternal organization called the Freemasons? Aren't those the guys that build walls? You bet they do. But every wall they build contains the secrets that have been kept and maintained throughout the ages, and it's encoded in the architecture and in the measurements of the buildings and in the mathematical form formulas used to derive the geometry and the shape, the length and breadth and height of rooms. It's all encoded there. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. And so they ordered his execution. It was actually ordered by the policy committee of the Bilderberg Group in The Hague in Geneva, Switzerland, and was carried out by agents of the secret government in Dallas. Um, the man who actually administered the coup de grace was the driver of the car, William Greer. We have a film in beautiful living color uh, that you can actually see with your own eyes William Greer turn with an assassination pistol in his left hand and shoot the president point blank in the head over his right shoulder. Um, it's incredible that it's been hidden from the public for all these years, but the same film has been shown on television for all these years, but they've always zoomed right in on Kennedy and cut the driver out so you can never see it. It's the Zapruder film. It was never shown to the Warren Commission. They never saw it. By this time, Bill had become a popular lecturer, 
author, and radio show host. His shortwave radio program, The Hour of the Time, could be heard five nights a week throughout the world. It was an event. It was always exciting, waiting for The Hour of the Time to come on, turning on your shortwave and hoping that that night that the propagation was good across the airwaves because, of course, shortwave is extremely susceptible to weather conditions. And when weather conditions are favorable, favorable uh, you're heard around the world. But when they're not, uh, you're not heard anywhere. So it was always, uh, there was an anticipation for the hour of the time coming on. I love the intro music. I, I waited to hear that siren starting and the dogs begin to bark because you knew that there was something exciting happening and Bill Cooper was on the air once again. Listening to the Hour of the Time, I'm William Cooper. For the first time in the history of the world, man was free. Literally, a king and queen in his or her own right. Over the years, that promise has extended to many other peoples. That promise eliminated slavery. That promise has caused poor, unhappy people living under tyranny all over the world to set their eyes on the shores of this country with only one thought in their mind to get here however they had to get here and even if they had to die in the process in order that they could also be free and so why ladies and gentlemen are we so eager to give it away for some imaginary new world order under a united nations charter that it will do away with war forever if you believe that, if you really believe that and you fall for that deception, you'll be so sorry for the rest of your lives. He had such a way with radio, uh, really took you back to, I think, in the pre-TV days when people used to sit around the radio and listen to it. That's what would happen in my living room. Friends would come over and we'd listen to Bill Cooper and uh, there was a certain nostalgia to it, but the fact that it, he was dealing with all of these current events and things that were happening right before our eyes uh, added more drama to the whole situation and it was just a wonderful experience every night sitting down and listening to Bill. Every time any church gets control of government the people suffer. It has always happened. That's why our founding fathers established a country where that was not supposed to happen, where everybody was free to worship at the altar of their choice. And if you think they were all of one mind, you better think again. How many religions of the Protestant group do you think existed in this country when our founding fathers put together the Constitution? Over 1,500 different groups all claiming they were right, teaching a different dogma, quoting scripture to justify what they said, and everybody else was going to hell. So don't give me this Christian nation bullshit, because that's what it is. This nation reflected Christian values because the people who made up the government in the early days were Christian but none of them agreed with each other, and they still don't today. Bill married, had children, and continued his life as a messenger by creating a large global civilian intelligence gathering organization called CAGI. Now, CAGI stands for the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, and it was Bill's research gathering arm of his whole operation. His principal idea behind CAGI was to get a whole group of 
uh, like-minded researchers and individuals, uh, patriots in the U.S. and throughout the world, really. Um, at one point, the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence was the largest civilian intelligence gathering organization in the world. And the one thing about CAGI was that it wasn't a secretive society like the FBI or CIA would be. It was an intelligence gathering organization with the idea of putting this gathered intelligence out to the rest of the world. During the late 90s, Bill's outspoken disposition would find him harassed by government agents who kept watch on him in Arizona and tried desperately to keep him quiet by accusing him of federal violations, including tax evasion and bank fraud, that to this day have yet to be validated. Essentially, by June, July 98, uh, I was moved here with Bill to conduct full-time research into the mystery schools and secret societies and uh, the government protocols in general. Uh, I was in the next town over running some business errands and came back and he came rushing out to meet me and uh, he said the federal marshals were just here. I said, what? He said, yeah, they came up and they said they were going to serve me with charges. Well, he counted them with the jurisdictional issue, which he is probably the expert on, or was the expert on, and is on the website. Because then they started, they, as in federal government, started pulling goofy stuff. Uh, agent Fillerup was an FBI agent out of Pine Top Lakeside. Agent Fillerup showed up one day, this is just a couple weeks after the federal marshal initial visit. We were out in the backyard barbecuing, which we often did. He got out of his Bronco and said, oh, I just want to talk like old friends. And uh, basically we told him we knew he was full of shit. And well, let, let me just hand you this envelope. And he's waving it. Now, and uh, we were still barbecuing away and he was still out the side of his vehicle there. And he goes, well, I'm going to come on up. And, and Bill told him point blank, do not come up here. You're not welcome. I'm not talking to you. You go back and tell your bosses that there's not going to be another Waco or Ruby Ridge in this country. And this time, you guys, and this was his own words, you stepped on your dick. And uh, he got back in and back down the hill. So he only had about a year, basically had a timeline to bring Bill in on these trumped up tax evasion charges and bank fraud. We did have a meeting with uh, a congressman and his staff. Uh, they, they, he brought his entire staff up to one of our backyard little barbecue things. and. We knew they were coming up, but we had to cook anyway. And uh, they they sat and, and talked to us for quite a while, but they weren't willing to help. And we were, like I say, always wanting a peaceful end to this and an answer to our jurisdictional questions. And to alleviate this problem, another thing we did was contacted any bank you'd ever dealt with, car loans, banks, uh, house loans, property loans, anything. Oh no, you're we're glowing customer, paid off early, never late. No fraud in existence. So essentially, when the year came up that filler up, filler up was quasi given as a deadline and nothing had taken place, uh, he was moved on, Agent Filler up to who knows where, maybe the real Siberia. And uh, things seemed to calm down a little bit. Um, and we were hoping that maybe it would just kind of go away. Unfortunately, things did not calm down. After Agent Fillerup's departure, more agents were assigned to watch Cooper, and Bill was eventually placed in what was known in the 90s as Filegate, where President Clinton ordered unconstitutional investigations into a number of individuals that were deemed a threat. The heat escalated to the point where Bill felt it was necessary to protect his wife and children by placing them in hiding for their own safety. It was now Bill and Doyle fighting the federal government on what seemed to be phantom charges. Towards maybe the last eight months or so of his life, because of events happening around the world and then culminating in 9-11, uh, as far as world type events, uh, Bill really turned the heat up on the people that would see this country's demise on his broadcast and on his website and at that point you could a person could tell if they had watched 
the happenings and knew the, knew the facts, not just the crap that was put in a paper here and there about Bill or the situation here, and had done the research that now it wasn't a matter of if but when for Bill's demise. In August of 2001, a local doctor by the name of Scott Hamlin had reported to local eager police that he had been harassed while parked on Bill's Hill by a man who followed him, pulled out a gun, and threatened him in front of his wife and kids. Even though it could not be proven that it was Bill, law enforcement now had a reason for serving a warrant for his arrest. Dr. Hamlin had been going up and playing real petty little games at night and up, up right next to Bill's property. Uh, this particular night he had his family up there and they claimed they were just up there to watch the, the lightning storms but the problem was is, uh, Dr. Hamlin would really egg people on. He was a, he's a real weasel and Bill had enough of it and ordered him off the whole area just get out of here I'm calling the cops. Now if Bill wanted to do harm to him he would not call the cops obviously. Uh, Bill told me about this the next day and that was pretty much all that was of it. The first warrant was served on September 11th of 2001 but was postponed. It would not be until November of 2001 when the police would finally make an attempt to raid Cooper. Cooper's broadcasts at this time had already been looking into the federal government's compliance in the events of 9-11. One of the things that makes everybody wonder why Bill was, Bill's life was snuffed out in, in 2001 was because in, in June of that year, uh, Osama bin Laden, who was a relative unknown at that time, Bill had been following the news and found a lot of curiosities and went on the air predicting that there would be a major attack in the United States and that it would be blamed on Osama bin Laden, but he was literally the, the scapegoat that was being used, not truly behind the attacks. So that, I mean, just a few months before the events of September 11th, and then of course Bill's life uh, cut short shortly thereafter. Supposedly, a CNN reporter found Osama bin Laden, took a television camera crew with him, went into Osama bin Laden's hideout, interviewed him and his top leadership and he came out and told everybody within three weeks Osama bin Laden is going to attack the United States and Israel. Now don't you think that's kind of strange folks? You see because the largest intelligence apparatus in the world with the biggest budget in the history of the world has been looking for Osama bin Laden for years and years and years and can't find him. Some doofus jerk off reporter with a camera crew bosses right into his hideout and interviews him. And I'm telling you, be prepared for a major attack. But it won't be Osama bin Laden. It will be those behind the New World Order. I wonder what Osama bin Laden's targets are supposed to be. And if they don't you know, if this doesn't materialize in the next two or three weeks, it will eventually materialize because because they haven't succeeded in getting the guns out of the hands of the American people, nor have they succeeded in taking our freedoms away. And so I can tell you with a certainty, they must do something terrible in order to stop this backlash and regain the sympathy of the mass herds of sheeple out there. Bill, Bill heard the commotion out here, just the ruckus, because the noise that comes up the road being so rough and stuff. He, he assumed, 
I guess that it was typical high school partiers because they leave their trash and stuff out and the local property owners all around us had come to us and asked us to run them off because they were destroying gates and fences. Um, he came out, got in his truck. Uh, his truck was always parked right out in front of the house there, right past the driveway. He would park just in front of the lawn, always normally face that direction. And uh, he whipped around the cul-de-sac, I would have to assume, because that's what always took place. And he then proceeded down the, this cul-de-sac here, which is uh, Clearview Circle Drive. He's 96 Clearview Circle Drive. That's on the county register. He came down here, and then at that point, he came down to go to this other end of the, of the street, which is right down there. You can see the sign and the gate. Okay, that's where they parked, and that was real common for the high school children and people making noise and throwing trash around and stuff to do. They would park down there. That particular owner owns the rest of the 40 acres down there, and he was particularly perturbed because they would vandalize his fences and cattle troughs. cul-de-sac here where the truck was parked. It was unmarked. No one was in uniforms. They did not identify themselves. That was it. They said that in their briefings the very next day. Uh, they were parked here. They intentionally had a vehicle with an incredibly loud stereo system and they made a lot of noise themselves, you know, hooting and hollering. Uh, Bill came down and told them, this is based on the law enforcement people that told me this, that were involved that night Bill told them if they didn't leave, he was calling the police, and they shunned him on. So he, he then turned around to go back to his home up there and call the police. Now, at that point, they were here, and he just basically turned right there, just out on this lot a little bit, and went on back. Right here out of this juniper was a spot I was told by law enforcement officials that uh, the first deputy came out right at... Bill's truck, because he was cruising along slow, watching them more than likely in his rearview mirror, me knowing him very well, uh, to make sure they didn't follow him back over there. He came out, and this is the point where Bill knocked him off sheerly with his arm, not ran over anything. Uh, that guy basically just landed on his butt, because Bill hit it, hit the gas. So he, had, he made this little curve here, and this is where he stopped. At this point, according to law enforcement officials, from their briefing and then plus people on site right then. When he stopped, one more person approached the vehicle, but not running. And that's when he did the open hands thing and a sign of, you know, like surrender or whatever. Here's where he hit up on the bank, just trying to get avoid the vehicle that then came shooting up here, full bore, full speed, came ripping up the hill. So obviously the people at the end had communications with people down there on the road. Must have verified the bill, turn around, coming back to his house. So they came zooming up here in a vehicle. He's avoiding them. He comes up on this bank. It was testified as that by the uh, law enforcement reports as well as the evidence on his vehicle that, that is what happened the exhaust system was tore off the bottom he then proceeded right there past the small elms and the driveway to the front of his yard I was told by the law enforcement officials that were on site and ones that had to come up afterwards and get a briefing so they knew what went on roughly because public was obviously going to be coming to try to come up here and news crews and all whatnot. They had put out that Bill is not to be 
let to that house, let back in that house alive. It was premeditated. It was put out. Bill will not be allowed back in alive. Right here at Bill's home is where he pulled up. Uh, his front of this vehicle would be towards me. Uh, the other vehicle was parked with his the front towards the other end of the street. Um, Bill ran around the back of his vehicle, which would be towards the driveway. He then proceeded across his yard. This is when the shooting began, according to their reports. The vehicle that was parked here besides his, his truck, which was pointed that way, he had bought for Jessica, his daughter, and then she didn't want it, so it was just sitting here. Uh, Sheriff Goldsmith was ran around the back of it, which would be towards me, and got on this street side to use the vehicle as protection. At that point, Bill is approximately halfway in the yard and still running with his back towards him. They claim at that point he began shooting, which was with his right arm just thrown backward, haphazardly pulling the trigger of a 38 snub nose Smith & Wesson. Uh, from where we're standing would be essentially the angle that Goldsmith would have been standing, but closer. Uh, Marina's would have been by the 58 Chevy, which would be equivalent to that truck, but backed all, but up all the way to the wall. Uh, next to that end post of the front porch. Uh, Bill was supposedly shooting backwards like this, which would be back towards the street in reality, that direction. When he hit marinas, that angle does not work at all. Plus, the bullet hole in the glass of the 58 Chevy indicates a bullet path of approximately this direction through the driver's roll-down window and out the passenger corner of the windshield, indicating clearly it went towards the dome in town, which is the high school field for playing during the winter. Um, at that point, Goldsmith opened fire uh, hitting Bill several times. Bill fell down right where the porch would start and the dirt would meet the concrete sidewalk next to the planter you can just slightly see raised on this side favoring me from the front door. That's where he fell and uh, according to them they quit shooting and he was dead. Our Apache County Sheriff's deputy is in the hospital after being shot in the head by a so-called militia member. Now what we know is that that militia member is dead. Our Gary Harper has the very latest on what's going on with that story. Gary? Marty Scott, this all happened in a little town called Eager, Arizona, which is just on the eastern side of the state of Arizona. It's almost on the border of New Mexico. This is what we know so far. Sheriff's deputies, we understand, were trying to serve some type of arrest warrant on a man by the name of William Cooper. He's also known as Bill Cooper. He reportedly has been known to be hostile toward law enforcement, so sheriff's deputies apparently disguised themselves as a bunch of rowdy teenagers in the back of a pickup truck in hopes of luring Cooper out, and it apparently worked. However, when Cooper realized what was happening, he reportedly pulled a gun and shot a 40-year-old deputy in the head. During the gunfight, Cooper himself was shot and he was killed. And he was killed. Now, this is what we know about Bill Cooper. Officials say he belongs to some kind of militia movement and has published several anti-establishment articles. He has a website, we understand, and on that website, he acknowledges that there is an arrest warrant for him, but he writes, and we're quoting here, any attempt by any federal government agent or anyone else to execute the unlawful arrest warrants will be met with armed resistance. Any person who attempts to kidnap our children will be shot upon discovery, and that is apparently what happened earlier this morning. Sometime after midnight, Cooper reportedly pulling a gun and shooting a 40-year-old Apache County Sheriff's Deputy in the head. That Sheriff's Deputy, we understand, has been flown to Phoenix where he is in a hospital. We are trying to get his condition right now. We do not know exactly what his condition is, and we understand that the militia member, uh, in this case Bill Cooper, uh, was shot to death. We do have a crew en route to Eager, Arizona, and we'll have a lot more coming up on tonight's news. All right. This was an extremely serious event not just because Bill had been shot, but what precipitated this? How did, how did this happen? Was this 
no one knew the answer. So immediately we got on the internet and we started searching, uh, downloading news articles from Arizona, uh, trying to find out. I got on the phone, was calling the hour of the time phone line, which of course was busy most of the time, and then I would leave a message when I could, please call me back, not understanding all of the chaos that Doyle was involved with that day as well. Can't trust the papers, as Bill would say. In fact, within the first sentence of the first article that was written about this in the Arizona Republican, the word militia appears. The name Timothy McVeigh appears. This kind of irresponsible journalism, unfortunately, um, was something Bill had to fight off for, as he would say, years and years and years and years and years. Bill was not a member of a militia, but he believed very strongly in the Second Amendment, and he did a program on how to form your own militia and do it legally. After Bill was killed, uh, virtually every newspaper article that you would see on Bill or any report in, on television or on radio uh, always mentioned Timothy McVeigh and that Timothy McVeigh and William Cooper were connected. And uh, Bill was portrayed as an extreme right-wing lunatic that uh, was encouraging the activities of Timothy McVeigh. While, while in fact Timothy McVeigh did listen to William Cooper and in fact visited him, uh, came up to Bill's Hill to visit him, uh, Bill told him to get lost. Michael Brescia, who is John Doe number two, the spitting image of the drawings that they put out, wearing the exact same cap that was worn by the man in the drawings that they put out, with the same tattoo on his left arm, stood in front of me for 10 minutes and talked to me in the company of Timothy McVeigh. And Tim McVeigh was not the leader. Tim McVeigh probably didn't say more than 25 or 30 words during the entire time. Michael Brescia did all of the talking. And the last thing he said before they left in their green Mercury Marquis station wagon with a puke yellow interior was watch Oklahoma City. If anyone was in charge, at least on that day, it was Michael Brescia, John Doe number two, not ever Timothy McVeigh. They told us during that conversation that they were setting out on a mission to make things better in this country and that they had the approval of the United States Army who had implanted them with computer chips, had given them their blessings and knew exactly where they were and what they were doing all the time. Bill was left to lie there in the front yard. Non-lethal devices are the supposed norm in the country and this state, it's supposedly stressed and was verified in newspaper articles afterwards, not even pertain to Bill's case, just informational articles out of the Arizona Republic. No such device was used, nets, stun guns, anything, all the fancy foams and rubber bullets, none of that. Uh, the Apache County coroner to declare Bill dead and deny him, obviously, medical treatment if he's dead, happened to be Dr. Scott Hamlin. Uh, he was not called, theoretically, because he'd be a conflict of interest, which he would be, but I can't believe they used such wise judgment now all of a sudden. So Navajo County had to be called to clear the next county over. And obviously woken up, you know, all this stuff. So there's a huge time frame here. But Bill received no medical treatment. The sheriff's deputies took it in their own hands and the paramedics that he did not need to be treated. He was just gone for good and that's all there was to it. DPS is wrapping up their all day long site investigation. Bill's body has been out there all day, so who knows how it was tampered with. Uh, cameras, nobody was allowed up there. You couldn't get within it to get camera views. Even the helicopters were shunned off, so they couldn't get views of the body. So there's no way to ever tell if it was moved a hundred times maybe before the ambulance picked it up. It was then taken to Tucson Forensics Lab for an autopsy.
Those of you who are smart enough to know what is transpiring here know that these are historic broadcasts. And by making these broadcasts, I have sealed my fate. I believe this, I found this to be true. If you're not walking on the razor blade, you're really living in a kind of death existence. You have to have that danger facing you that if I slip, I'm dead. That's what makes you live. That's what gives you life. That's what gives you purpose. And I sincerely believe that any man or woman who does not have principles for which they're ready and willing to die for at any given moment that they're called upon to do that, is already dead and are of no use or consequence to themselves or anyone else and will be unhappy throughout their life for that very reason and that very reason alone. Okay, this is Main Street of Springervale, the town that's connected to Eager and this is the, uh, also the highway coming in to Springerville from St. John's. Uh, this is our research center that we opened up after Bill's death. Uh, we had to close it due to financial constraints um, recently. You're seeing the last of it. Um, what, what this room contained was the core research books and articles. Uh, along every wall that you see, seven shelves high, from fl literally from the floor, to up high was solid books. We categorized them and alphabetized them by, categ by category and then alphabetized them in each category so it was easy to look up. Down the middle here were all desks and with all the outlets we had the ability that people could come in and use each format of digital, or I mean excuse me, of uh, media, for instance beta, VHS, hi8, whatever, with a monitor and they could use books and I made arrangements with the copy shop down the street and they would make copies for us at a reduced rate. Um, that way the books never left the building. Uh, this whole front portion from this here, here, was solid file cabinets, completely packed full, every single drawer, the big file cabinets of in individual pieces of research material. Rare transcripts, any of that stuff, all this we still possess. I just have it in safe storage now. This was the studio, the audio and video portions. Watch your step. Uh, back here, just the remnants of cable. Uh, all my masters are just down here on the floor. Bills are all preserved in a safe place. Those are just the masters of all my broadcast. And um, in here was audio and video set up and all our duplication order fulfillment. And here is the famous microphone that Bill uh, loved so much and talked about on the air, the RCA tube mic right here. Uh, he really liked this microphone a lot. From when he got it, that's all he used on the broadcast. How old is it? Oh, 40s. This is one of his, his Vietnam service medals. Now, some of his were um, just destroyed over the years moving. So he had put together this batch uh, prior to his death because he wanted to uh, kind of make it an, uh, an assemblage of the medals that were over there at the time that people were earning for the Quaviet website. And this one's the Republic of Vietnam's uh, Service Medal. Here's the Commendation Medal. And above them you see the ribbon that you wear. This is really for decorative purposes only and hi historical. Really, uh, you don't ever wear these except for the when they're pinned on you and you take them off. Uh, this one right here is Naval Service and here is National Defense Service Medal. These, uh, some of these pieces down, well all these pieces down here were some of Bill's favorites um, that he had in his work area on display. Uh, that was his Say No to the UN plaque he got from the Lansing, Michigan speech. 
Uh, that tape will be familiar to many in the audience. Because when I'm here, I'm just Bill Cooper. I'm talking to you from my heart. When I'm on the radio, I am on a mission. And that mission is to slap people upside the head and wake them up and even make them hate me if that's what it takes to get them to go examine what I'm telling them to find out that it's right. You see, I don't care how it's done as long as they wake up. And if I have to be the bad guy that they're going to hate for the rest of their life, that's okay with me if I wake them up. And Bella writes uh, from a very old, old print, and they uh, fixed it to that wood placard and gave that to him, some of his friends. Um, the saint casting out Lucifer. He always had that was by the kitchen. Uh, this is one of his all-time favorite records ever. Uh, Love is a gentle thing. Here was a. Uh, here's a nice reproduction of the Declaration of Independence for the States of America. And here is a uh, a leather embossed plaque that uh, Eva and I had gotten Bill um, for his birthday back in uh, 1999, 2000, one or the other. Um, it's the Prayer at Valley Forge from the famous painting of George Washington praying, asking for guidance. He has this copper um, engraved plate and raised of uh, JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th president. Uh, this is one of Bill's favorite pieces, hung in the hall entryway of the house. Mm, I don't know where he even got this, but he really liked it and made sure it was always up wherever he moved. The story of how I came upon this site is a, a unique one. Uh, tasked with having to find a site in not much time, I went to the city of Springerville and this was one of the few things that worked out smoothly following his death, and at least with all the arrangements. Uh, I went down there, uh, the city personnel in Springerville knew my situation and why I was there. Uh, they gave me the funeral plot on a handshake and let me pay it off a month later. And they even had the city working crew, the field crew that would have to dig it, uh, come out after hours that day when they could have been home because they weren't getting paid and meet me. Uh, it's an old cemetery, basically uh, a very crude mapping system because of the age of the graves. Uh, I met Tom, the city crew member, right down there at the entryway and I parked, he was behind me. And I got out of the vehicle, said, hey, let's take a look. And he goes, well, let's just start walking around and see what you think. Uh, I, I saw this elm tree here and was drawn here almost like a, magnetically. It was really strange. And the hair on, the, on my neck almost stood up the whole time. And I walked with a purpose straight to that tree and then looked over here and walked straight to here. No him hawing, skipped a lot of space. And I look out here and it's the exact view that Bill loved. In the after mornings, afternoons, whenever, but afternoons is favorite. It's the same view we had from his back porch where we would barbecue and sit and listen to shortwave radio at night and watch the sunset and the snow and just beautifully loved it. He talked about it on the radio often. Um, so I'm standing here, I'm looking at this, and it's amazing. I'm still getting this chill feeling. And I look over like this, and there's Bill's house perfectly in line. And this is essentially the exact same elevation and line of his back porch where he always sat and enjoyed the view of this valley, the round valley here. And I said, well, what about this spot here? And he says, oh, I think that's taken. So he pulls out this map, a lot of it hand-drawn and added to. And lo and behold, he goes, well, I'll be dang, there's two spots open here. I thought they were full. And I said, I want this one no matter what. Uh, the gentleman, Tom, he, uh, circled the area with cones and parked, a, and parked a vehicle here and notified the city crews that no one wanted to get this spot because it was for uh, Bill and that's pretty much how it happened. Is North Carolina. Okay, so there's at least okay. a description North of Carolina being put down now. Down with the 
These are from Michigan. Okay, now we're getting one. These are Petoskey stones. Petoskey stones from Michigan. Yeah, okay. This also came from Lisa. It's from a rock from Washington State. Where's that one from? Vermont. Both? Yes. The tumbled flint from Ohio. Flint Ridge, flint Ridge actually, no less. This is from Chicago, Illinois. Cracked around already. It oh. is a geo. Oh, Look at that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Probably due to the light and circumstances, the research he was involved in and what he was exposing, I have no doubt he is in a much better place not having to mess with this anymore. And, uh, but he left behind a huge hole in society and, and this whole genre of research that cannot be filled by anyone else, at least that I've ever ran into in this field or expect to run into. He's missed by many. And he made his fair share of enemies. But sometimes that happens if you're going to call her bluff, especially in front of five or 10,000 guests at a speaking engagement. Ideally, we hope the hour of the time will continue forever, or at least as long as Doyle and I are around, which is going to be a good long time. <laughs> good long time. <laughs> um, we'd like to take the hour of the time in the same direction Bill was always pointing it. Uh, we, we don't want to deviate too far from that. Granted, we have to make the hour of the time a bit more our own. Bill Cooper's not around anymore, and we are constantly uh, receiving emails, both good and bad, some saying, excellent job guys, really appreciate what you're doing, and some of them saying, you know, Bill wouldn't have done it this way. Well, unfortunately, Bill's not around anymore, and he's not here to tell us how he might have done things. Uh, I think between Doyle and myself, we have a good understanding of, of what Bill would have wanted us to do. Some of it's in writing. <laughs> and those things we are following to the T, and definitely the pursuit of truth is key, and the more knowledge you get, the closer you get to that goal. I've seen too much through my life happenings to verify the problems and, the, and uh, this whole one world government scheme. They're definitely not backing off. Uh, I've been privy to too much knowledge and research materials to give it up now. The naysayers out there that say it can't be re reverted back or our only choice is to sit here and wait for Christ to come because we're doomed or whatever I don't agree with because the same thing was told to the Founding Fathers and Framers. And uh, look what that small handful of men and colonies did and the ripples it caused around the world. And forever in world history what it's going to have caused. Um, you know, they took on the, the British Empire. The sun never sets on the British Empire was the logo at the time. and um, The most powerful government in pretty much world history to that point and they took it on a bunch of people that knew that what was going on was wrong and defeated it and because of that the revolution the declaration of independence and the constitution and bill of rights we completely rewrote the history of mankind this country did and to see it squandered because of a few families and secret societies uh, behind the scenes pulling the strings of our fiat, essentially fiat government, uh, would be to, to look back at all those men and women and children, included everything, that have died preserving that heritage in this country and just calling it all a waste of time. Everybody's fought for it and died for it and, or been hurt one way or the other. That would be a complete waste of their lives and to throw it away directly myself with possession of Bill's archives and stuff would just be saying that Bill's life was meaningless to just box it up or just to turn it off and say later. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Nothing on the face of this earth is going to stop me from broadcasting. Period. I will begin making tapes. 
and I will make them in the hundreds and distribute them all over this country. And the people who receive those tapes will make tens and hundreds of copies and distribute them also, and we will have an underground radio. Beyond a doubt, I think the work that introduced Bill Cooper to the world has to be Behold a Pale Horse. And Bill told him point blank. Do not come up here, you're not welcome, I'm not talking to you. And you go back and tell your bosses that there's not going to be another Waco or Ruby Ridge in this country. Marty Scott, this all happened in a little town called Eager, Arizona, which is just on the eastern side of the state of Arizona. It's almost on the border of New Mexico. This is what we know so far. Sheriff's deputies, we understand, were trying to serve some type of an arrest warrant on a man by the name of William Cooper. He's also known as Bill Cooper. Do you understand what I'm talking about? What is our common bond truly? Freedom! Uh, in this case, Bill Cooper uh, was shot to death. We do have a crew en route to Eager, Arizona, and we'll have a lot more coming up on tonight's news. Most people are no better than animals who do not have intelligence because they don't use their intelligence. And to these men who control things behind the scenes, you are stakes on the table by choice and consent and will always be ruled and manipulated and enslaved by people who do use their brains. Bill hated right wing, hated left wing, he hated these labels. He was an American. He believed in the US Constitution and if you were right wing you had an agenda, if you're left wing you had an agenda. Bill had no agenda. Bill believed in the Constitution.